restoring the church. Now, God is in the business of saving souls. That includes not just the church, it, inclu it includes the whole world. But He has a special heart, a special place for His church. Thank you, Pastor Elmer. As Pastor Elmer mentioned, I am pastoring a church at Pine House. I know at least one hand that is from Pine House here, and he is on my side, my head elder, Glyde. <laughs> We're glad to have you with us, leading in powerful songs, elder. Are there any other hands that I can witness? No. But I'm glad that we have some joining us this morning. So... The message that I have prepared today is taken from Philippians 4, verses 2 to 3. And we also will read the following verses, ending with verse 9. But before we go there, why don't we have another word of prayer? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you are invested in our spiritual growth. But more so, Lord, you are invested in our unity. Father, we have come together this week because we want to be together again. And Lord, we pray that you will be among us. Speak to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I spent a few years in the Philippines. And the exposure that I had there was very good because I, I had the privilege to get to know a different worldview, different lifestyle, different circumstances, which helped me to see with different eyes as well. You know, when we come together, as our theme says, we have to learn to see with different eyes. We have to learn to see with other people's eyes. And, and it's something difficult to do when, when all you know is what you grew up with, when you have only your own experience. And that was my challenge when I came to the Philippines. I came to the Philippines and I, thought I saw different ways. I, thought I saw different methods. And I thought, I'm going to teach these people. <laughs> I'm going to teach them how to do things the right way, my way. Little did I know that one man is not going to change the whole country. As a matter of fact, I had to learn that I was the one who had to be changed and not the people. So it is good to come together because it's an opportunity to learn and grow from each other. God has a special interest in this theme. I actually believe that this is one of the most important themes for humanity and for God. Because together again suggests that you were once together, then you were separated, and now you want to be together Again, it is a kind of reunion. Has any of you been reunited with somebody you have been with and then separated for five years? Okay, we see hands. Ten years. Twenty years. This hand keeps raising. Forty years. Wow. When you come together after such a long period, the first, the, first the first feeling that you have is excitement, right? You are so excited to see this person, this, this person you cared for. You now see him again. There is a moment of, of rejoicing. There is a moment of celebration. But then if, you, if the person remains and you live in the same place, 
and you do things together, you notice that this person is not the same person anymore. The one that I knew 20, 30, 40 years ago. And not only this person is different, you are a different person. Both of you have changed. And that's a beautiful thing. We ought to change. We have to change. We grow. We do not remain the same. Now, the good news is that Jesus doesn't change. Jesus remains the same. So, when, when I say that this is the most important or probably the most important theme for God and for people is because God wants to be reunited with us. But when we find Him, it will be the same God that Scripture has revealed to us. God does not change. But here on earth, you and I, we, we are faced with this challenge. How do we continue when opinions change, when views change, when whole cultures change? How do we continue to be together in such an environment? Where do we go from the changes? Where do we go from there? And what, what do we do next? Let's go to Philippians, the text that we want to look at today. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. And the title of my sermon today are simply two names, Sintichi and Euodia. Now, you, these are two names that we don't hear too often, but we will talk a little bit about these two faithful women this morning. Paul gives, in the, in the text, Paul gives great encouragement to the church of Philippi. But just before he goes, uh, just before he, he has done that, before he goes and, and encourages the church, he wants to make sure that there is nothing in between. There is nothing that could hold the church back from a, a great experience and, and, and harmony in the church as they continue. He addresses an issue that's been happening between two women. And as I mentioned them, it's Sintichi and Euodia. These two ladies, they had an issue. We're not told what the issue was. We're not told how it came to the problem. We are not told how the problem resolved. But we're told these two ladies had an issue. And it was serious enough for Paul to mention it. Now remember, Paul is going to read this, le this letter that Paul wrote will be read to the whole church. Imagine you had the problem with, with your neighbor or with a sister in the church, and your pastor is writing you a letter and is telling the elder, Elder, read this, read this letter to the church. And your name is mentioned. <laughs> now imagine that 400 years later, all you are known for is for having that conflict with your sister. <laughs> this, is, this is the issue that we have here. This ladies, they went down in history for having a conflict. But Paul turned it to something beautiful. We can learn beautiful lessons from what has been mentioned in the letter to the Philippi. Let's read verses 1 to 3. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you who I have loved and longed for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Now, what a way to start a letter. And even more so when you're about to correct somebody. I want to stop here for a moment and take a lesson out of this. Paul begins by giving a context to whatever he's about to say. He begins by making sure that whoever is listening does not feel attacked, 
does not feel criticized, does not feel belittled. He makes sure that whoever is listening knows that Paul loves these people. Paul cares for them with all his heart. He is, not only is he, he, does he care for them, he is proud of them. Remember, they're having a conflict and he's about to put them on the, on the spot. But he says, I am proud of you, even though you have that conflict. So Paul puts a context to it. And then he continues that he is going to correct the issue that keeps dividing the church. Have you ever felt like you needed to correct somebody? Have you ever felt ever in a way that this brother is stepping out of his boundaries? I need to do something about this brother. Have you been there? Now friends, if you have nothing good to say to the brother to begin with, don't begin correcting. <laughs> I plead with you. That's what Paul does. I plead with you. Do not correct somebody if you have nothing good to say to him. Make sure your heart is set right with the person. Love this person. Be proud of this person. Be willing to stand up to anyone and defend this person before you go up to him. And put yourself in a position where you're going to be a father or a mother, or a brother or a sister to the man or the woman. Now here's the lesson from Paul. We need to establish the goal to lift people up and to bring them back together whenever we want to correct them. Verse 2, I plead. Paul uses a big word. He says, I plead with Judea. And I plead with Synthetchi to be of the same mind. And he doesn't stop there. He says, in the Lord. To be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women. Since they have contended at my sight and the cause of the gospel. Along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers. And he underlines whose names are in the book of life. These names, these are saved people. Saved people who are struggling with each other. We've been separated for a long time in COVID. Separated physically. And we praise God that we, we live in a time where we had other methods to come together and still fellowship. We thank God for this opportunity. And yet when we come together, and we actually socialize, and we talk to each other, we may come to a point where we see, hey, some of our views have changed, especially when new problems like COVID arise, and other issues that come with it. Notice, friends, Paul didn't take sides when he went to correct. He didn't say, one is right and the other is wrong. He just me mentioned the point, there is a conflict. Help these sisters to come together again. Now, I want to make a very important point, friends. I want to emphasize, campers, that there are differences we may have which are not of eternal value. We will always have differences. There will never be a point where we agree on every single point. But they are not of eternal consequences or value. We can be of the same mind, though, in one point for sure, and that is Jesus. And that's where Paul is leading these two ladies who just can't find a way to agree with each other. And he says, agree in Christ. That's the one point, the one place where you two are of the same mind. You know, this is our Advent message. Our message is to bring people to Jesus. Is to help people be united in 
Christ. Jesus is coming back. And Jesus is coming back to take who? Those who are united in Christ. Those who have given their hearts to Him. Those who are following His words and His commandments. That's who God is coming for. The Advent message includes the promise that Jesus is present with you today. Present with us when we come together. It includes that. And it includes that the Holy Spirit is there to make your life on earth not only bearable, but pleasing, joyful, and, and something that you really can appreciate, something that you can rejoice in. God wants to give us love, peace, joy, and hope, not just in heaven, but here on earth. And that we can experience when we come together, when we are united. We have to spend time, friends, in the Word when we come together. We have to spend time in the Word because that's how we get to know Jesus. We get to know His character. We get to know how He acted, that we can imitate him too. As we come closer and closer to the end of the days, we need to spend more time together in studying scripture and knowing who God really is. The messenger, our prophet, warns us that Satan will work hard to divide the church. Satan will try his best to bring confusion and counterfeits into our midst. He will bring opinions of men and present them a sound doctrine. Now we need to be able to differentiate between those two. He will present presumption as a substitute to faith. Worship or will worship rather than the substitution to the will of God will counterfeit holiness. By turning the people away from God's law, he will counterfeit righteousness. And, and he will fake miracles, and evil, evil angels will impersonate dead relatives in order to bring confusion and, and division into the church. Finally, he will even try to impersonate Christ. However, however, God did not leave us without a tool to be prepared for all the, the seed that is ahead of us. God gave us tools to be ready for that. How can we safeguard ourselves from this? How can we safeguard ourselves from deception? How can we make sure that we can remain faithful? I want to share a quote with you, friends, from the day before dawn on page 12. And the prophet says this, Satan can present a counterfeit so closely resembling the truth that it deceives those who are willing to be deceived, who desire to shun self-denial and sacrifice demanded by the truth. And I underline the word truth. But it is impossible for him to hold under his power one soul who honestly desires at whatever cost to know truth. And then, then she says these heavy words. And I want you to listen carefully. Christ is the truth. He is this truth. He is the one we need to know. He is the one who prepares us to be ready, to be able to decipher to be able to make the difference. Friends, self is the enemy of same-mindedness. When Paul is calling these two women to be of the same mind, self will always be the enemy of that. You know what Christ called us for in Matthew. He said, if anyone wills to follow me, let him deny himself. 
take up his cross and follow me. We need to deny self. And we cannot, we cannot overcome opinion if we are not willing to deny self. Self is the enemy. Now, Christ is the only one who is able to bring unity among us because he's only one, the only one who can give us the strength to overcome self. And God's weapon for man on earth to overcome trials, temptations, and deceit is when we are united in Christ. When Elijah lost faith, God did not remind him of the fire that he just threw down from heaven. He did not remind him how he gave him victory over the 400 prophets of Baal. He did not remind him of the glorious miracles that he did in, in Egypt for Israel. He reminded him that there are others that remain faithful. That he is not alone. Friends, it is so important for us to come together again. Because it is an opportunity for you to encourage. It is an opportunity for you to not feel left alone. But know that there are others who remain faithful. Others who give you the strength and the courage to hold on to Christ when the world does not. Our text continues in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. You know, Paul, when he corrects these two women, when he tells them, be of the same mind, come together, resolve these issues, then he tells them how to remain in Christ, how to continue. You know, when we go through camp, when we come and we meet and we find our differences, we, we find this is not working and that is not working and he cut the line and this one on this overstepped and I don't like this food, I want, you to, I want to remind you back to this text. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Why? Because the Lord is near. Let it be evident. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every th situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, sometimes we need to step back. We need to step back on our, on our views and on our opinions in order to make people feel comfortable in order to give people the space to grow, to lose all their, their anxious, anxiety, to lose fear, to just feel accepted. Sometimes it is not needed to teach doctrine, but to show doctrine, to be the sermon. You know, during my field school in the Philippines, there was a church that I started joining. It was a Sunday keeping church and I was joining them in their worship. Not a single time did I preach to, preach to them about the Sabbath. Because I would step into a church that is comfortable and feels peace on Sunday and I would disrupt that peace without having a relationship with them. They had no reason to trust me. The Bible uh, preaches and it warns us there will be false prophets. These members read the same Bible and I step into this church and I could be a wolf and I'll present new doctrine to them. Sometimes it is needed for us to build a relationship before 
we present doctrine. And that's the way God approached us. There were so many things Jesus didn't teach the disciples on day one. There are so many things they didn't get on the last day. They only got afterwards. So we need to take time to have comfort and unity among ourselves so that people open their hearts and are willing to trust you when you present them with truth. I want to begin closing with an old poem. You know, church, church is like marriage. We say, you know the saying, marriage is what you make it, right? Church is what you make it. And there is no perfect church out there. Everybody has his own, own struggles, own disagreements. But listen to this poem. I think that I shall never see a church that's all it ought to be. A church whose members never stray beyond the straits and narrow way. A church that has no empty pews, whose preacher never has the blues. A church whose deacons always deek, and none is proud and all are meek. Where gossips never peddle lies, or make complaints or criticize. Where all our ways, sweet and kind, and all the others, faults are blind. Such perfect churches there may be, but none of them are known to me. But still, we'll work and pray and plan to make our own the best we can. Let us bring unity to the church. When we come together, accept each other. Don't criticize, but appreciate those who you have. May God give us the strength to give up on self so we can have the ability, the godly ability to do that. Amen.